When you think of states rich in history, one state that should be top of mind is Ohio. After all, seven U.S. presidents were born in Ohio, and one other, while not born here, made Ohio their home. It's where you will find examples of America's most prestigious castles, as well as most haunted mansions. Ohio is also where you will find several of the oldest covered bridges, as well as the longest one in the nation. And, as far as final resting places, Cleveland's Lakeview Cemetery alone has such historical figures as President James A. Garfield, John D. Rockefeller, and Elliot Ness, among other important dignitaries. But, taking a moment more to look deeper into individual cities and towns, you'll find even more stories and treasure galore. And one such city is Rocky River, where we'll be traveling to today to explore the historical places and faces that make this city shine. Right here on History and Relics. In the late 1920s through 1930s, almost all roads in aviation led to Cleveland, Ohio, as it was here where the national air races made their home. The 1920s also ushered in a new era of liberation for women, immediately following World War I. The aftermath of the war also provided a new passion for aviation, creating a surplus of affordable aircraft and trained pilots. In August 1929, Cleveland hosted its first national air race, which featured many notable male pilots. However, Cleveland's itinerary also included the inaugural National Women's Air Derby, although many journalists referred to it as the Powder Puff Derby after it was first coined that by Will Rogers. The Cleveland races also prompted several of the lady pilots to discuss the possibility of creating a women aviators organization. That organization would later be known as the 99's Club. Their first official meeting was held on November 2, 1929 at Curtis Field on Long Island, New York. Amelia Earhart would later be elected as the group's first president in 1931. But where exactly in Cleveland did those early conversations take place? The answer? At the luxurious Westlake Hotel in Rocky River, Ohio. The Westlake Hotel was a 400 guest room suite facility built on the hallowed grounds of the Silverthorn Inn, formerly known as Wright's Tavern, which stood on the spot with an unrivaled view of the river for over a hundred years. Opening in 1925, the Westlake, with its Mediterranean brick and stucco architecture, a combination of Old Florida and Deco era Hollywood, was the closest and finest hotel near the Cleveland Municipal Airport now known as Hopkins International. And so, the hotel became a must-stop for aviators such as Amelia Earhart, Charles Lindbergh, Jimmy Doolittle, and others. While occupants enjoying the hotel residents' lifestyle might not have noticed, the Great Depression had its effect on tourism. The hotel owners defaulted and operated the place under receivership until it was sold to a committee of bondholders in 1935. It rebounded by 1953 when more guests were arriving in cars than on trains, so a double-deck parking garage was added. Nine years later, the magnificent landmark caught fire. An alarm went off at 6 a.m. on January 25, 1962 for a kitchen grease fire, and at 7.30 a.m. another alarm sounded on the roof. The hotel had long been deemed fireproof, and that may have been what limited the fire damage to the roof which was destroyed. Water damage occurred throughout the building though, and 175 residents, 160 of them permanent, were evacuated for several weeks. 
the once luxurious hotel of the 1920s and 30s that drew Hollywood movie stars, famous aviators, and other high society dignitaries would soon only be a dreamy memory. The hotel has since changed with the times and became a condominium complex. Even with this modern use, there have been bursts of VIP vibrancy as a number of sports figures had once made the Westlake their home, including local NFL greats Tom Cousineau and Bernie Kosar in the early 1980s. Yul Brenner was also seen here in 1985 while performing in a touring production of The King and I. Today, the structure is as beautiful as ever and still makes a head-turning statement igniting the imagination back to its golden days of a simpler yet somehow more sophisticated era. The home you see here at 19420 Fraser Drive in Rocky River is a replica of the original 1906 home once owned by James H. Van Dorn. The original home was destroyed by fire in 1991 but was rebuilt in 1993 based on vintage photos and drawings. The home is a neoclassical block building form which overlooks the Cleveland Yacht Club. Van Dorn was the founder of the Cleveland Wrought Iron Fence Company, which later became the Van Dorn Iron Works Company established in 1872. Van Dorn mastered the art of metal fabrication, creating ornamental fences, frames for stoves, streetcar vestibules, bicycle parts, and metal office furniture. It later dabbled in aluminum and plastics manufacturing. While preparing a bid for fencing of Milwaukee Cemetery, someone spoke to him about jail cells. Realizing that jail cells are nothing more than fences built indoors, his business quickly changed directions and became the largest jail cell producer in the world throughout the 20th century. Van Dorn touted his cells as being the strongest, with improved locking devices, most convenient and best ventilated cells in use at the time. Van Dorn Iron Works manufactured nearly 28,000 cells between 1918 and 1938, selling them throughout the greater Cleveland area as well as across the United States and abroad. The company ceased production of cells in 1967. By 1985, Van Dorn boasted 19 plants in seven states, Puerto Rico and Canada. Once employing over 1,100 people, Deindustrialization would eventually cause the company to consolidate and sell major portions of its business to other foreign and domestic entities, leaving just five plants in the United States by 1995. Cleveland, known as the rock and roll capital of the world, not only for its impactful contributions to rock and roll, but for the many individuals who are from this area that made Cleveland such a historic site. After all, it was WJW radio disc jockey Alan Freed who first coined the term rock and roll in 1951. Leading up to the early 1950s, it was Lakewood, Ohio native and Rocky River High School graduate Sammy Kay who paved the way for many as a big band leader and songwriter. Sammy's first hit single was Swing and Sway in 1937, from which he was given the catchy tagline of Swing and Sway with Sammy Kay. Most everyone has heard of, or is familiar with, legendary piano man Fats Domino. One of Fats' biggest hits was Blueberry Hill in 1956, which reached number two for three weeks on the Billboard Top 40, and spent eight non-consecutive weeks at number one on the R&B bestsellers chart. The music for Blueberry Hill was composed years earlier by Vincent Rose, with lyrics by Larry Stock and Al Lewis. The song was turned down by publishers until being bought and published in 1940 by Chappell and Company. The song was recorded over 10 times that year and the first person to record and release Blueberry Hill was Sammy Kay on May 31, 1940. The first hit version of Blueberry Hill was done by the Glenn Miller Orchestra who recorded it in Chicago on June 13, 1940, with Ray Eberl on vocals. The song reached number two on the U.S. charts. Shortly after, it was recorded by Gene Autry in August 1940, but not released until 1941, when the motion picture, The Singing Hill, was released. Sammy Kay was posthumously inducted into the Big Band and Jazz Hall of Fame in 1992 
and for his contributions to the recording industry, has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Music that discusses blue-collar life is a music style that has a direct, candid, and honest approach. It's a conviction expressed through rock and roll, with a message and purpose that goes well beyond simple entertainment. This is Heartland Music, the soundtrack of working-class America. And one of the best singer-songwriters to have ever expressed this style of music is Cleveland's own Michael Stanley. Michael Stanley was born in Cleveland and graduated from Rocky River High School in 1966. He received a baseball scholarship to Hiram College, but his real passion was rock and roll. While attending college, he was in a band called Silk, who released their first album, Smooth as Raw Silk, in 1969. Michael graduated with a bachelor's degree a year later. Michael managed a record store for a short time before deciding to go solo in 1973 with the releases of Michael Stanley and Friends and Legends, which had enormous support and contributions from the likes of Joe Walsh, Todd Rundgren, Rick Derringer, Dan Fogelberg, and Jay Giles, among others. In 1974, the Michael Stanley Band, or MSB, was formed. Chart-topping hits such as He Can't Love You, In the Heartland, and My Town helped to set several attendance records at Cleveland venues, including over 20,000 at the Richfield Coliseum in 1979, 40,000 for two other Coliseum shows in 1981 and 1982, and more than 74,000 during a four-night stint at Blossom Music Center in 1982. The band parted ways in 1987, but shortly after you would find Michael on TV as the co-host for the popular PM Magazine on Channel 8. In 1990, he entered radio and became a disc jockey for WMMS for a short time before moving over to WNCX. When he wasn't behind the mic on the radio, you would still find him writing, recording, and performing his music live right up till just a few weeks before his passing in 2021, after losing his battle with cancer. MTV was launched on Saturday, August 1st, 1981, at 12.01 a.m. The first video to air on MTV was one emblematic of MTV's concept, Video Killed the Radio Star, by The Buggles. Notably, the seventh video to air was Brass in Pocket, by The Pretenders, headed up by Akron, Ohio native, Chrissy Hines. Nina Blackwood was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, but grew up on the west side of Cleveland. She attended Rocky River High School, graduating in 1970. She then moved to California, where she studied acting at the Strasburg Institute. Nina was chosen to be one of MTV's original video jockeys, along with Martha Quinn, Mark Goodman, Alan Hunter, and J.J. Jackson. John Waite's hit single, Missing You, from 1984, was partly written about Nina and others to whom Waite once dated. Nina left MTV in 1986 and has since done a number of various things, from making film appearances to hosting radio programs. One of the greatest rivalries in baseball has been between the Cleveland Indians and New York Yankees, from the early 1900s to present day. That history includes a dreadful day in August 1920 during a game between the two teams in New York when New York pitcher Carl Mays threw a fatal pitch that killed Indian shortstop Ray Chapman, who remains the only major leaguer in history to be killed by a pitched ball. A less traumatic example was on July 17, 1941, when Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak came to a close at Cleveland Municipal Stadium by Cleveland third baseman Ken Keltner. But DiMaggio was unfazed, as the next day he started a fresh hitting streak that ran to 16 in all after getting a hit off of Bob Feller. After DiMaggio's Hall of Fame career, one of his biggest endeavors was endorsing and promoting Mr. Coffee Coffee Makers. Beginning in 1973, sales were bolstered by TV advertising that featured the Yankees legend who became the face of Mr. Coffee for over 20 years but that stint would have never taken place if it were not for Edmund Angel Abel Jr. of Rocky River. Edmund Abel Jr. was, among other things, an inventor who held several patents. The most famous of these came about when he was employed as a co-designer with North American Systems, or NAS. There, he developed the heating element used in the Mr. Coffee machines. 
Edmunds heating element for the coffee maker was unveiled at the National Houseware Show in Chicago in 1971. His invention brewed a milder coffee than traditional methods, largely replacing the percolator in American homes. However, Ed signed over his commission rights to NAS about 1972 when the company began production of the coffee maker. Outside of his normal salary, he received no other monetary award or royalties for his invention. And because of that, Ed never once drank a cup of coffee. The man who served as the longest owner of the New York Yankees in club history from 1973 to 2010, winner of seven World Series and 11 American League pennants, was none other than Rocky River native George Michael Steinbrenner, also known as the boss. While studying to earn a master's degree in physical education at Ohio State University in 1954 and 1955, he served as a graduate assistant to legendary Buckeye football coach Woody Hayes. The Buckeyes were undefeated national champions that season and also won the Rose Bowl. In 1960, Steinbrenner entered the sports franchise business for the first time not with baseball, but rather with the Cleveland Pipers basketball team of the National Industrial Basketball League, or NIBL. Steinbrenner is credited for hiring future Hall of Fame coach John McClendon, who became the first African-American coach in professional basketball. Steinbrenner also convinced future Basketball Hall of Famer and Olympic gold medalist Jerry Lucas to join his team instead of their rival, the National Basketball Association. In 1971, Steinbrenner, along with former Indians third baseman Al Rosen, had a gentleman's agreement with James Stouffer to purchase the Cleveland Indians. But before the official press release happened, James's father and Rocky River resident Vernon Stouffer, who was the rightful owner of the Indians, as well as the founder of the Stouffer Hotels, Restaurant, and Frozen Food Companies, said no deal to Steinbrenner's low offer. The team would later be sold to Nick Miletti. Between 1965 and 1972, CBS, or Columbia Broadcasting System, owned the Yankees. However, in 1972, there was talk of selling the team. CBS chairman William S. Paley offered the franchise to team president E. Michael Burke so long as he could secure financial backing. Steinbrenner, still quite interested in owning a baseball team, was introduced to Burke by veteran baseball executive Gabe Paul. On January 3, 1973, Steinbrenner and minority partner Burke led a group of investors in purchasing the Yankees from CBS. And the rest, as they say, is history. In 1977, the movie Smoking the Bandit, starring Burt Reynolds, Sally Field, Jerry Reed, and Jackie Gleason, was a box office success, becoming the second highest grossing film that year behind Star Wars. Another set of familiar faces in the movie was Pat McCormick and Paul Williams, who played Big and Little Enos Burdett. Big Enos was a flamboyant Texan aspiring to political office in Georgia and needed a vast amount of beer for a rally. That's when the bandit and Cletus accepted the dare from the two big shots to pick up a truckload of beer from Texas and return it to them within a short period of time. Pat McCormick was born in Lakewood, Ohio in 1927 and was in the Rocky River High School graduating class of 1945. He served in the Army during World War II and later studied at Harvard before finding his real passion in acting and comedy writing. In the early 1970s through 1980s, he wrote for a number of performers, including Red Skelton, Phyllis Diller, Don Rickles, and Johnny Carson, as well as for shows including Get Smart. He even co-starred with George Carlin in the 1984 HBO TV pilot Apartment 2C, and was the ghost of Christmas Present in Scrooged in 1988, starring Bill Murray. But at six foot seven inches tall and 250 pounds, it was his role as Big Enos Burdett in the Smokey and the Bandit series that he'll be most remembered for. 
Brian K. Vaughn was born in Cleveland in 1976 and grew up in Rocky River in Westlake. Vaughn studied film at the New York University Tisch School of the Arts. While there, he participated in Marvel Comics' Stan Hatton Project, a class for amateur comic book writers. Vaughn's first credit was for Marvel Comics' Tales from the Age of Apocalypse No. 2 from December 1996. Vaughn became an award-winning writer of comics. He wrote for some of the highest profile characters at Marvel, including X-Men, Spider-Man, and Captain America. He also wrote for DC Comics, Batman and Green Lantern, as well as Dark Horse Comics, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Between 2004 and 2006, Brian dabbled in television, being the writer, executive story editor, and producer for seasons three to five on the ABC TV series Lost. In 2009, he was the showrunner and executive producer for Stephen King's TV series, Under the Dome. Then, in 2011, Steven Spielberg selected Vaughn to adapt the Stephen King novel, Under the Dome, into a television series for Showtime. Recently, he has written the comic book series Paper Girls and Saga, which has won numerous awards, including the Harvey, Eisner, and Hugo Awards. Michael Lewis Chernus was born in Rocky River in 1977. He later graduated from Juilliard School's Drama Division and has acted in a host of films, television, and stage productions. He has appeared in such films as 2012's Men in Black 3, as Jeffrey Price, and as Arthur Ingram in The Bourne Legacy. His most notable role was Cal Chapman in the Netflix original comedy drama series Orange is the New Black where he appeared in 17 episodes between 2013 and 2019. And coming up next year, he'll be playing the role of John Wayne Gacy in the Peacock series, Devil in Disguise. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program. If you like our content, we ask that you give us a thumbs up, a like, share with your friends. Subscribe to our channel and ring that notification bell so you always know when our new content is published. And all of this costs nothing but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. You may also leave us a tip if you choose. The address is provided here on your screen and a link is provided in the description area below. So until next time everyone, this one is history.